Hello, my name is Richard Vache. I'm a professor in the chemistry department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The goal of this presentation is to give a brief introduction to mass spectrometry as a technique with a particular emphasis on the most common mass analyzers used in modern mass spectrometers. I would like to start with a brief overview of mass spectrometry as an analytical measurement tool. Mass spectrometry is capable of providing multiple levels of information about compounds or analytes of interest, including the molecular mass, the elemental composition, and structural information. Now, many people think that their mass spectrometer is going to provide the molecular weight of whatever compounds they are analyzing. In actual fact, the key piece of information that a mass spectrometer provides is the mass to charge ratio, which is then related to the molecular mass. Molecular weight, of course, is a weighted average of sorts that considers all the isotopes and their different masses in a molecule. Because mass spectrometers measure mass, which is a universal property of matter, this makes mass spectrometry such a broadly applicable analytical tool. As I just alluded to, many of the atoms that make up molecules have more than one isotope, and the resulting patterns of masses that arise from these isotopes can often be used to determine a molecule's elemental composition. Finally, mass spectrometers can provide structural information by determining the connectivity between different functional groups in a molecule. This information is obtained via fragmentation that can occur during certain ionization methods or dissociation that's purposely caused during, in the context of a tandem mass spectrometry or MSMS -MS experiment. And mass spectrometry will be discussed at the end of this presentation. A convenient way to discuss how a mass spectrometer works is to consider its main components, which can be seen on this slide. We need some way to introduce the sample into the mass spectrometer. Oftentimes this inlet system is a gas chromatography system or a liquid chromatography system. Once the analytes are introduced, they need to be ionized in an ion source. And then the resulting ions can be mass analyzed by a mass analyzer on their way to being detected. The resulting mass spectrum is a plot, as we can see here, of ion abundance versus mass to charge ratio. Now, because ions can be very high re reactive and the mass analyzers that we use work best when ions do not undergo collisions with gas molecules, mass analysis is best done in a vacuum system. Now this vacuum system can encompass all the components of a mass spectrometer. Sometimes it only <clears throat> the sample inlet system and the ion source itself can be outside the vacuum system. In this case, ions, which perhaps are produced at atmospheric pressure, are then transferred into the vacuum system where mass analysis occurs. So just to reiterate the basic idea, <clears throat> in mass spectrometry, we need to make gas phase ions, and that's a very important part, and that's why the ion source is so essential. And actually, more precisely, mass spectrometry might be better termed mass to charge spectrometry, but that, of course, is a mouthful, and I don't know anybody who calls it that. These gas phase ions are then analyzed under low pressure, and when we do the mass analysis this way, mass spectrometry is a very sensitive technique which is part of the reason it's such a powerful technique and maybe why you're listening to this presentation today. So if we dig a little bit deeper, in effect, mass have three main components, an ion source, a mass analyzer, and a detector. I'm gonna mostly focus on how the mass analyzer works, or the very different ones, but I do wanna say a few words about ion sources and detection. There are two general types of ionization techniques. There are so-called gas phase techniques. And these are ones that require separate steps of sample volatilization and then ionization. And the common ones are electron ionization or EI and chemical ionization or CI. Desorption techniques are methods in which the volatilization and the ionization occur at the same time such as electrospray ionization and matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, or MALDI. I believe Kevin Shug will be talking more about these techniques, so I won't say more here about ionization. Detectors, moving off to the far right of our block diagram here, are what let us know 
which mass to charge ratios have been separated by the mass analyzer. And they're also gonna give us a rough indication of how many of those different mass to charge ratios are, how, many, how much of a given mass to charge ratio is present. Now detectors all work by converting the ions into some kind of electrical signal that can be processed by a computer to give the x-axis of a mass spectrum. And there are two general types of detectors in mass spectrometers. There are electron multiplier or microchannel plates, and there's image current detection. In an electron multiplier, the idea here is that ions are going to impinge on some kind of surface. This is going to cause a cascade of electrons that then will lead to amplification of that signal. In image current <coughs> detection, ions pass by a metal plate and induce a current on these nearby plates as they go by. Now we'll talk about later image current detection in the context of two different types of mass analyzers. The main component that we need to discuss and which is gonna be the heart and the bulk of this presentation is the mass analyzer itself. Well, it turns out there are many different types of mass analyzers. And I list several of them here. Each has their different advantages and disadvantages. And there are many different ways to couple more than one type of mass analyzer together to create hybrid mass analyzers that provide new measurement capabilities. Now, even though we have so many different types of mass analyzers, they all work on the same principle. And that is the mass analyzer is essentially a physics experiment that takes advantage of Newton's second law of motion, which is, most of you know, summarized by the equation F equals MA. So in effect, what a mass spectrometer or a mass analyzer is going to do is going to use a magnetic or an electric field that's going to exert a force on the ion via the charge that it has. That force will cause the ion to accelerate to different extents depending upon the mass of the ion. Now, in case you're wondering, the charge on the ion, which is important in the mass to charge measurement, affects the magnitude of the force that gets exerted on the ion. So for example, an ion with two charges will experience twice the force of that of an ion with only a single charge. So far, we've learned that ions are in mass spectrometry are separated by their mass to charge ratio, and mass analyzers use physics, essentially Newton's second law of motion, to provide that mass analysis. <clears throat> So when a mass spectrometer makes these measurements, it's worthwhile to consider some figures of merit that describe how well this mass measurement is made. The two most common figures of merit are mass accuracy and mass resolution, or sometimes we'll call it resolving power when we're talking about what the mass analyzer actually can do. These figures of merit are useful for characterizing different mass analyzers, and we're gonna see as we progress through this presentation that different types of mass analyzers have different abilities to accurately measure mass or to resolve uh, peaks in a spectrum. Now mass accuracy, let's talk about that first. So mass accuracy is how close to an ion's true mass to charge ratio the mass analyzer can measure. And not surprisingly, the closer the better. Now we typically quantify this uh, and can express it in two different ways. As a relative measure, and often in a parts per million, where the measured value is compared to what the theoretical could be, and then we multiply by a million to get a value in parts per million. Or we can do an absolute measure of mass accuracy, where we usually refer to it in millimass units, which is a, uh, you know, as you can see, one to times 10 to the minus three uh, mass units, or in millidaltons, and the the smaller the difference is, the better. <clears throat> mass resolution is the ability of the mass analyzer to separate ions of very similar mass to charge ratios. So or to put it another way, two peaks at a similar but slightly different mass to charge ratio are resolved when the detection of one does not significantly interfere with the detection of the other. <clears throat> We typically refer to this as resolving power when we talk about the mass analyzer, and it's defined as m divided by delta m, where m is the mass of the ion of interest, 
And then delta m can be the width of the peak at half maximum, or it can be the mass to charge difference between two resolved peaks. So as an example of what resolving power looks like, slide, I give you an example of a peptide with four charges that was detected. And to fully resolve the isotopes for this multiply charged peptide ion, an analyzer resolving power of about 8,000 is needed. And so what we can see here is the peaks are separated even though their mass to charge ratios are quite small in the difference. Example, and in this particular case of a very high resolving power, I show a singly charged small molecule that has the isotopes between the monoisotopic mass and the what we would refer to as the M plus one mass to charge, which is one isotope higher. And you can see the very large gap between these and that represents the very high resolving power of 100,000 here. And so this would be an example of a very high resolving power, and the previous slide would be somewhat moderate resolving power. <clears throat> One issue that is important to appreciate, just because a mass analyzer has higher resolving power does not mean it has a higher mass accuracy. Here I show an example of a doubly charged peptide ion, and with resolving power of about just under 2,000, which would be a good resolving power. If the resolution, the mass resolving power is increased, we can clearly see that the peaks are better resolved, but this does not guarantee higher mass accuracy. Indeed, for this example, the mass accuracy is actually quite poor, as indicated by the dotted line, which in this particular case represents the true mass to charge ratio of this peptide. You can see that it's off. An important point to make is that mass analyzers can provide high mass accuracy only if they are properly calibrated via good mass calibration. And even if the resolution is very good, the mass accuracy can be poor. Oftentimes, a very high, a higher mass resolving power can lead to better mass accuracy, but it doesn't guarantee it without a good calibration. Now that we have some terminology out of the way, let's talk about more specific types of mass analyzers. Two general types of mass analyzers. There are beam type analyzers and trapping analyzers. Beam type analyzers are ones in which ions are accelerated through an electric and or magnetic field and are separated in time and in space. And there are three general types of beam type analyzers. There's the time of flight mass analyzer or the TOF. There are quadrupole mass analyzers. And then there's double focusing mass analyzers. In a moment, I'm going to talk more about the time of flight mass analyzer and the quadrupole mass analyzer. And I'm not going to say anything about double focusing mass analyzers that use uh, an electric sector and a magnetic sector, an electric field and a magnetic field. If I gave this presentation about 30 years ago or so, these types of mass analyzers would have been front and center in this discussion, um, but not as much anymore. And so I'm not going to discuss them today. The other type of general mass analyzer are trapping analyzers. These are analyzers in which ions are going to be injected into an electric or magnetic field. And that those fields are going to trap the ions. And then they will be detected by ejection from the field that's trapping them. Or they might be detected while they are oscillating in that field. And there are three different types of trapping analyzers. There's the quadrupole ion trap. There's a Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass analyzer, or an FTICR, and then there is an orbit trap. We're going to first dig in by starting to talk about the beam type analyzers. The first, and probably the simplest to understand, is a time of flight mass analyzer, or a TOF. The name pretty much tells you how it works. Ions are analyzed by the time it takes for them to go from where they're created in the ion source all the way through a drift tube to a detector. Mass analysis in a time of flight is much like a race, <clears throat> but in this case, the least massive ions are detected first because they arrive at the detector faster, and then the most massive arrive later, <clears throat> and in this way, uh, providing a mass uh, spectrum. <clears throat> One thing to know is the way this works in terms of math is to think about all the ions are accelerated 
at a given kinetic energy that depends on their charge. When this happens, they're gonna achieve some kinetic energy that is gonna influence their velocity in a mass dependent way. So then the time it takes for them to go from the ion source to the detector depends on the length of the tube and the velocity at which of the ions are going. The classic time equals distance divided by rate. Now, if we plug in these equations, we can find that the time of flight or the time it takes for an ion to go from the ion source to the detector will be inversely proportional to the square root of the mass to charge ratio, or excuse me, directly proportional to the mass to charge ratio, square root of the mass to charge ratio um, of the ions. <clears throat> Now, one of the key features of time of flight mass analyzers is that they have, in principle, an unlimited mass to charge range. However, the upper mass to charge limit of any time of flight mass analyzer is often dictated by the detector that is used. And so that it really doesn't in practice have an unlimited mass to charge range. Another feature about time of flights that are worth pointing out is that they couple well with ionization techniques such as MALDI, because MALDI, <clears throat> the fact that the laser is fired to produce ions provides a well-defined starting place and time for ions to be created to start the race to the detector. Now, the linear configuration that I show here in the time of flight, however, has some drawbacks, <clears throat> as very often ions are not created at exactly the same time or place. And then, therefore, ions of the same master charge ratio can reach the detector at slightly different times and then effect this would lead to poor resolution. So to overcome this phenomenon or this drawback, most or many time of flight instruments these days, certainly the commercial ones, have and use a reflectron which acts like an ion mirror that can correct for some of these deviations in the starting points of the ions and the starting times of the ions. And this allows the use of a reflectron allows for improved resolution. And so overall, time of flight mass analyzers often have moderate mass accuracy and resolving power. The second type of beam analyzer that we're gonna talk about, quadrupole mass analyzer. Now the quadrupole is a fairly complicated mathematically to understand what's going on, but the device is relatively straightforward. As the name suggests, a quadrupole consists of four rods <clears throat> to which are applied RF and DC voltages. Now my cartoon rendering here on the left is missing one of those rods just to remove it so that you could quote unquote see the ions and how they move through the device from the ion source to the detector. A better way to think about in the device is to think about four rods. They can be cylindrical but often they are hyperbolic rods and to these rods are applied RF voltages that have an amplitude of V and a frequency of omega and a DC voltage that is indicated here by U. Now, a very important point to make is that the rods of the quadrupole have RF voltages of the same amplitude applied to them, but adjacent rods are gonna have this frequencies applied in such a way that they are 180 degrees out of phase. So the, the rods that have the plus here and the minus will have RF voltages 180 degrees out of phase. In addition, these adjacent rods indicated by plus and minuses will have different polarity DC voltages that are applied. So for example, the ones that are shown with negative will have a negative DC voltage as indicated with minus U. And the ones indicated with the positive sign will have a positive DC voltage. Now the result of applying these voltages to the rods is the production of an electrodynamic field that affects ion motion in two dimensions. So if we think about those two dimensions, we can think about it in the X dimension, if we look at these rods, and the Y dimension, which would be in and out of the screen. The fields do not affect the ion's motion in the Z dimension, which would be along the axis of the quadrupoles, as I go from left to right here on the screen. This electrodynamic field allows ions with a very small range of mass to charge ratios to be passed through the quadrupole mass filter. A mass spectrum then is acquired by increasing the RF and DC voltages at a constant ratio so that smaller, then bigger, and then finally the biggest mass to charge ratio ions can make it through the, to the detector. 
<clears throat> relative to other types of mass analyzers, quadrupoles have low mass accuracy and resolving power, but they are excellent for quantitation, something I'll come back to later in the presentation. They are often part of hybrid mass spectrometers or as part of what we'll call later triple quadrupole mass spectrometers, and they can be used quite effectively to do tandem mass spectrometry. So now I'd like to turn our attention to the trapping mass analyzer. As I mentioned before, there are three types of trapping mass analyzers. The first that we'll discuss is a quadrupole ion trap. <clears throat> With a quadrupole as part of its name, you might conclude that there are four poles or four rods or something like that, but the three-dimensional quadrupole ion trap version consists of three electrodes. There is a ring electrode that's sort of like a donut and shown in this picture here. In the cartoon, I show a cutaway view where the ring electrode comes in and out of the screen. And then there are two end cap electrodes that are sort of like doorknobs that come up against the donut of the ring electrode. Now this device works by applying an RF voltage to the ring electrode. And this RF voltage creates a 3D trapping field that's quadrupole polar in nature. And that's actually where it gets its name, um, is a uh, quadrupole ion trap. Now this three-dimensional trapping field allows all the ions above a certain mass to charge ratio to be trapped depending on the magnitude of the RF field applied to <coughs> the ring electrode. And ions are then mass selectively untrapped and detected by increasing the RF amplitude that's applied to this ring electrode. And so ions of low mass to charge ratio are first ejected to the detector, and then eventually the bigger ones, and then the biggest ones are ultimately sent to the detector. <clears throat> now, ions, like in the quadrupole mass analyzer, the quadrupole ion trap has relatively low mass accuracy and resolving power. But the ion trapping nature of the quadrupole ion trap makes it excellent for MSMS, or tandem mass spectrometry experiments and even multiple stages of MSMS, which we refer to as MS to the N. The trapping field also makes it outstanding for doing ion chemistry in the gas phase, which opens up new possibilities for analysis. We can also create a two-dimensional version of a quadrupole ion trap, and that can be seen here. Now, this trapping device is much like a quadrupole mass analyzer, except that we're gonna end up applying DC voltages to these N rods here, to allow ions to be trapped in three dimensions. So just like in the quadrupole mass analyzer, adjacent rods are going to have RF voltages that are 180 degrees out of phase from one another. Although in this case, there will not be DC voltages applied to these rods. In this device, in this schematic, these center rods are where the RF voltages are applied. And the two end sets of rods have also have the same RF voltages applied but in addition, D, a constant DC voltage that provides trapping in a third dimension. So the, just like in the quadrupole mass analyzer, the RF field provides trapping in two dimensions. <clears throat> and now in this case, the DC applied to these end rods provides trapping in a third dimension to create a three, effectively a three-dimensional field. Just like in the three-dimensional quadrupole ion trap, Ions are gonna be mass selectively untrapped and then detected. And this particular device, that untrapping and detection occurs outside these middle rods where a detector would be placed here and on the other side. <clears throat> and just like in the three-dimensional quadrupole ion trap, it has relatively low mass accuracy and resolving power. But again, it is excellent at doing MSMS and MS to the end, and ion chemistry can also be done in this device instrument to introduce is the Fourier Transform Ion Cyclotron Resonance Mass Analyzer, or the FTICR. It's often referred to as an FTMS, although it's not the only instrument that uses a Fourier transform in acquiring a mass spectrum. This particular type of mass analyzer uses a very strong magnetic field, often something between 7 and 15 Tesla, although there are ones that are larger than that, and it uses magnets that are very similar to those used in NMR. So if you've ever seen an NMR or if you've ever seen an FTICR, you know that these are very big magnets. 
This magnetic field provides trapping in two dimensions, as ions are going to oscillate around the magnetic field. But to maintain trapping in three dimensions, an electric field has to be applied. After being injected into this device, the ions are going to, the trapped ions are going to oscillate around the magnetic field <coughs> and at frequencies that depend upon their mass to charge ratios. Now these oscillations around the magnetic field can then be non-destructively detected via image current detection, which I talked about earlier in the presentation. And in fact, the frequencies of all the ions can be detected at the same time, and that is where a Fourier transform is needed to determine the frequencies of all the ions. These frequencies, because they are mass to charge dependent, allow us to then acquire a mass spectrum. <clears throat> and one of the nice features of an FTICR is that it provides very high mass accuracy and very high resolving power. It achieves this because of the very stable magnetic field that it uses and because very low vacuum pressures uh, are used. And so we can determine these mass, mass values, mass to charge ratios, very precisely and very accurately, and therefore giving rise to the high mass accuracy and high resolving power. <clears throat> and another important note to bring up is that this higher resolving power and a higher mass accuracy is achieved, or higher resolving power is achieved by detecting the ions over a time frame of seconds. This is much slower, and in fact, usually about an order of magnitude slower than the analysis on the pre preceding mass analyzers that we talked about. And so with the slow acquisition, though, comes this higher resolving power. The Orbitrap has similar features to the FTICR in that ions are detected via image current as they oscillate in mass to charge dependent fre uh, frequencies. In this case, an electric field is applied to the spindle electrode in the middle of the device relative to outer electrodes that are typically grounded. Now, when ions are brought into this field, they oscillate around the spindle in mass to charge dependent frequencies, but they also oscillate back and forth in this direction along the Z axis, and it is that, those oscillations that we use for mass analysis. Those are also mass to charge dependent and we can use those massage part dependent isolations to detect the ions using image current detection on plates here. Now, all of the ions can be measured at the same time, all the frequencies are measured at the same time, and therefore a Fourier transform is necessary to deconvolute the frequencies and lead to the mass to charge ratio measurements. Just like in an FTICR, we get very high mass accuracy because of this and high resolving power. But it's really important to point out that orbit traps are only found as part of hybrid mass spectrometers. But one nice advantage of the orbit trap is that they often, they don't first off require these large magnets that are used in FTICR well, and the associated cost and challenges associated with maintaining such large electromagnets, but can often provide high mass accuracy and resolving powers that rival those obtained on FTICRs. Orbit traps, another feature to point out is that they can't do MSMS. They're in fact, one of the reasons they're often part of hybrid mass spectrometers is that so MSMS can be achieved while also using the high mass accuracy and resolving power of the orbit trap. Now I've talked about this idea of hybrid mass spectrometer and what these are are instruments that have one, more than one mass analyzer and they've become a very popular way to achieve improved performance and new capability in the mass measurement. Hybrid mass spectrometers enable advantages of more than one analyzer to be realized in a single instrument. And so typically these mass analyzers are gonna consist of something like a quadrupole ion trap and an orbit trap. Or just in general, they're gonna consist of a mass analyzer that is very good at doing MSMS, such as a quadrupole ion trap or a quadrupole mass analyzer, and an analyzer that's very good at providing high mass accuracy and resolving power, like an orbit trap or a time of flight or an FTMS. This example here shows the two dimensional quadrupole ion trap and an orbit trap, and coupling these two in a hybrid mass spectrometer often requires many other features to be able to direct ions from where they're made into one of the mass analyzers 
all the way to one of the other mass analyzers. And so the sophistication of these instruments um, is significant, but the performance that results is often um, quite powerful. Now I've mentioned mass tandem mass multiple times now, but I haven't fully explained it. So let me quickly do that. During MSMS, an ion of interest that's been produced in an ion source is mass analyzed and then can be selected or isolated in some way. And then it's reacted to cause it to dissociate into a series of product ions. And those product ions can be mass analyzed. Now, one of the key features of tandem mass spectrometry, as I mentioned at the outset, is its ability to provide structural information. And it does this by determining or providing mass differences between the initial precursor ion that's selected for the reaction and the product ions that are measured. So the mass differences between the precursor and the product ions often can reveal the functional groups that are present in a molecule. Now the reactions that are done typically involve dissociation and there are three general types. Collision-induced dissociation, sometimes also referred to as collisionally activated dissociation. Electron transfer dissociation, or uh, sometimes it's a, an analogous technique, electron capture dissociation. And photo dissociation, which is uses UV or IR photons to deposit energy into the ions. Collision-induced dissociation, or CID, is probably the most common technique used to dissociation ions in tandem mass spectrometry. Now you might ask, why we, would we want to do MS? Now there's two at least general reasons. The first is qualitative. As I explained in the previous slide, structural information about analytes can be obtained as the tandem mass spectrum effectively provides a fingerprint of the ion, and often this information is obtained and it is like a puzzle that has to be used to identify what that ion is. But because the mass measurement can be done often in combination with liquid chromatography or gas chromatography, we can do this and identify compounds in complex mixtures, both because of the separation that happens prior to mass spectrometry, but also because the MSMS experiment can be done rather quickly. There are quantitative reasons why you might want to do MSMS as well because it can provide a highly specific quantitation um, of an ion in a mixture. It can do effectively interference-free quantitation or almost interference quantitation using techniques known as single reaction monitoring or multiple reaction monitoring. Now very quickly, the necessary to conduct MSMS experiment typically involves two different types of setups. The first is referred to as a tandem in space MSMS experiment where multiple mass analyzers are gonna be used. And in this experiment, a first mass analyzer is gonna take a collection of ions, select the one of interest. Those ions will then be moved to a reaction cell where the dissociation can occur to produce different product ions that can then be mass analyzed and detected. <clears throat> the second way that a MSMS experiment can be done is what's known as tandem in time where now the mass MSMS experiment is done in a single mass analyzer and all the MSMS steps are done there. They're just done sequentially in time. In this approach, a collection of ions might be made, brought into an, a trapping device. Sometime later, we're gonna isolate the one mass to charge ratio that we're interested in, ejecting all the rest. And then sometime later in the same device, we will do the dissociation to create product ions that then can be mass analyzed to create our tandem mass spectrum. A common new instrument that's used to do tandem in space MSMS experiments is a triple quadrupole mass analyzer. I put triple in quotes here because even though historically three quadrupoles might have been used to create a tandem in space mass analyzer, nowadays the center collision cell is no longer a quadrupole, it's something else. But in a triple quad, what is done is, as I mentioned in the previous slide, ions are, the ion of interest is selected through going through the first quadrupole. Those ions are then directed into a collision cell where they can dissociate into product ions that then can be mass analyzed by a second quadrupole to create our tandem mass spectrum. 
Triple quads can be operated in many different scan modes, which represents a you know, tremendous flexibility. <clears throat> they, we can do product ion scans, like what I just described here, or we can do other types of scans known as precursor ion scans, neutral loss scans, and then quantitative experiments that take advantage of single reaction monitoring and multiple reaction monitoring. Now, <clears throat> these, each of these experiments can provide either qualitative information or quantitative information, and triple quads in particular are quite excellent for quantifying, quantifying analytes and mixtures. And a in time type of mass spectrometer is best illustrated with a quadrupole ion trap. MSMS in this case is done by trapping all the ions sometime later, isolating one that we care about, dissociating them, and then later mass analyzing them. And this is all done in the same space and in the same device. 3D and 2D quadrupole ion traps are really good at doing MSMS, but Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass analyzers are also capable of doing it. They're just not as good as the 3D or 2D traps. And when we do this, we can do product ion scans where we look at all the products from a precursor, or we can do an experiment known as parallel reaction monitoring, which can be done by analyzing the resulting data in an appropriate way. Now these tandem and time experiments provide very high MSMS efficiency and they can do so in a very fast way, providing very high throughput. And this is one of the reasons that these types of tandem and time devices are often used in proteomics experiments and often are used the backbone of these proteomic experiments. So of course there's say about mass analyzers and I've already talked for about 35 minutes so let me just summarize what I've told you. First off measuring the masses of components in a sample <clears throat> requires the sample components to be first ionized and then detected and so mass to charge spectrometry might be a better term but that's a mouthful so mass spectrometry is what we'll stick with. This mass analysis is done on the basis of Newton's second law the basic principle of force equals mass times acceleration we talked about the fact that mass analyzers come in two general types. There are beam type analyzers in which ions are moved from one location to the next and separated in space to be analyzed or trapping analyzers where ions are all brought into the same location and then over time they're going to be mass analyzed. We can combine many two or more types of mass analyzers to provide enhanced measurement capabilities via the formation of hybrid mass spectrometers that are quite popular today. And then finally, tandem mass spectrometry is often best conducted in triple quadrupoles or quadrupole ion traps, and they are able to provide both qualitative structural information and quantitative information. <clears throat>